Okie doke, so welcome. We're gonna get started. Thanks for showing up. My name is Kevin Saracino. We, I've been sending emails, so you might know me from there. So again, thanks for being here. Uh, the weather is what it is, you know. April, it's gonna be 80 Sunday, so we have that to look forward to. But anyways, uh, before we get into the good stuff, I'm gonna do a quick introduction on who Chagrin River Watershed Partners is, and we're gonna, Munson Township's gonna do a quick hello, and make sure you say thank you to them for letting us use their wonderful facilities. Okay, so really quickly, who is Chagrin River Watershed Partners? And what is a watershed? Let's start with that. So in case you're unaware, a watershed is an area of land that drains to a specific body of water. So in the Chagrin, watersheds case, Chagrin River Watersheds case, it's all of the land that drains specifically to the Chagrin River. So we were formed in 1996 as a nonprofit, do like different things like grant management, project management. We handle trainings like this for different environmental related things like, as you know, water goes into ditches from people's property and then it goes into rivers and it's important that we keep them maintained and stabilized. It's like, you know, eroding ditches and eroding streams and everything like that brings sediment and different problems, different like phosphorus and nitrogen into the rivers and lakes. And as we're all, I'm sure, well aware, Lake Erie gets algae blooms, which is like a result of these issues, which we like to control. Okay, so as I mentioned, CRWP does a whole lot of different projects like ordinance adoption. We assist with code implementation for different communities. We've put on trainings like this, kind of covered some of this so we can move through this quickly. We're also part of an org a group called the Central Lake Erie Basin Collaborative, which is a network of different watershed groups in the area. Northern Ohio is kind of unique. We have a whole lot of different watershed organizations, which is a good thing. So through this collaboration, we all work together to kind of coordinate what we're doing so we can be as efficient as possible and we're not maybe like competing for like different award fundings and things like that. So with that, that's all I have. If anyone has questions, feel free to you know, raise your hand at any time. So we're gonna talk about why dirt is bad in streams. I'm sure you guys already know that. Unstabilized ditch is just bare soil exposed to flowing water. Uh, here's a lovely one and it's a discharge of sediment to nearby streams. So this is a lovely example. This is a photo of the Chagrin River in Eastlake uh, where Corporation Creek enters the Chagrin. Here's the main channel. Uh, and you can see this nice lovely color here and that. So we have a lot of sediment in the Chagrin River watershed. Uh, it also transports roadway pollutants into waterways. There's a, a study going on right now with Ohio State University that we're a part of looking at uh, nutrients entering the watershed from specific land uses. And we've seen a lot of salt coming in and adding salinity to the watershed. So why do we care? This is from last year right by my house. This is the Chagrin River. Uh, sediment has a negative impact on water quality. I say it looks like chocolate milk, and chocolate milk is bad in the river. Uh, contaminated sediments travel through the food chain to wildlife and humans. Uh, too much sediment reduces habitat potential, and the sediment is sticky. So contaminants coat sediment particles, and then they go into the, the ditch, and then they go into the stream, and you know, you end up with uh, increased phosphorus, nitrogen, and other nutrients. And that can lead to algal blooms on Lake Erie, just one example. Um, in our area, we've got the brook trout, which is currently a state-threatened species. Um, anecdotally, I've heard it's going to be added to the state endangered species list uh, this year. Uh, brook trout spawn over gravel and pebble. So too much sediment chokes the gravel. They're not able to spawn. Um, the eggs need a steady flow of clean, cool water. This is just one example of a species that cannot live in a system with a heavy sedimentation. Downstream impacts, uh, sediment fills storm drains and catch basins. You all know this. There's a lovely culvert filled in. Increased potential for flooding. It's actually my yard. Additional sediment increases treatment costs for drinking water, and then sediment can alter the flow of water and reduce water depth. In 
then Ohio EPA says the primary causes of non-point source impairment in Ohio streams are habitat alteration, hydro modification to stream channels, sediment, and excessive nutrients. So whatever we can do to stop that is good. We also prepared a model code. Um, so if you are in an MS4, you're required to stabilize your ditches. If you're not in an MS4 uh, and you still do it, thank you. But we created a model code for non-MS4s, which just brings a little bit of accountability. Um, it brings erosion and sediment control during construction of road projects, post-construction stormwater control measures to treat runoff from roads. Um, we also included recommendations for best practices to limit pollution, um, which is good housekeeping for road and service departments. And then communities are encouraged to implement these best practices um, and consider portions of the model code. So this is available on our website and then on ODNR's website. And here in just a couple seconds, we're gonna have ODNR speak. So we're able to put on this workshop because of a, a partnership we have with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Office of Coastal Management program. Um, and we have Amanda here who's gonna talk to you a little bit about that program. Um, thanks for being here. And thanks to Chagrin River Watershed Partners and Munson Township for our um, Collaborating, collaborating with us on the, um, this effort. So I'm Amanda Kovach with Ohio Department of Natural Resources Office of Coastal Management. We're based in Sandusky, but we go all over the, the state, the length of the coast from east to west. Um, and I just wanna give you all, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with our office um, or the program that is kind of the impetus for this workshop, I wanted to give a quick overview. So I'll stay within my time. Um, but just a couple of factoids about Lake Erie. A lot of these you'll know, but I think it's interesting. We are an office because of the lake. We are specifically focused on the coastline. So Ohio Division of Natural Resources has all sorts of um, other departments, divisions, and we work on the coast. <coughs> um, but the, the thing I like here, the, the fact I like uh, is this retention time, 2.6 years. That means that a drop of water if it starts, uh, say, on the western <coughs> end of Lake Erie, it will take 2.6 years to travel and leave the lake if we're going west to east, um, in theory. So that's, that's actually short compared to some of the other Great Lakes. But um, on this slide, <coughs> um, you know, we are the most southerly, we are the shallowest and warmest, and by default, or I guess by those properties, we are one of the most productive or the, productive, the most productive Great Lake. Um, that's why we have our great fishery, um, but that's why we also have some of our algal issues in addition to the nutrients that will flow off the landscape into the lake. But um, it is great to be in a productive habitat, um, but it can come with some of its drawbacks. And one of the reasons we have to, to keep sedimentation and nutrients from flowing into the lake. Um, and on this set of facts, uh, you know, you probably already appreciate this, but 23%, nearly a quarter of Ohio's population uh, lives along the lake. So along our coastlines, really populated area. Okay, um, a little bit about the office um, or the coastal management program. We were formed in the 70s and federally approved in the 90s. Um, and the goal of coastal management comes down from the federal level to the state level um, is to achieve the wise use of land and water resources in the coastal zone, giving full consideration to ecological, cultural, historic, and aesthetic values and the need for compatible economic development. So we can't promote habitat restoration without considering the economy and vice versa. We try to uh, work them both hand in hand. And a little bit um, back to the coastal zone that was mentioned in that, in that um, slide. We're looking at lakeward from our coastline to the boundary with Canada into the lake. And then landward, it can vary from west to east a handful of miles landward um, or just maybe um, about a mile landward and that's all based on landscape it's based on if you have rivers or um, estuaries in that area so sometimes it's just a sliver of land and sometimes it can be several miles inland depending on where you are um, our office does a number of things so i work as a grant manager and i also work as um, an environmental scientist um, I have background in water quality, so I work on the non-point source pollution program um, that we're gonna talk about in a minute. So we work with grant management, we help municipalities, um, nonprofits, all sorts of groups get money from the state and the federal level 
um, and then we help manage those projects. We have regulatory programs, so our engineers will help you with things like uh, shore structure permits or submerged lands leases or areas where you're concerned about erosion. Um, outreach and education like today, technical assistance kind of gets back to what our engineers do. If you're concerned about a, a piece of coastline, they'll come out and help you maybe figure out how to stabilize it or the best way to do that. Um, and then today, the biggest thing is the Coastal Nonpoint Pollution Control Program. So I won't spend too much time here, but grant management, you may recognize grants like our Coastal Management Assistance Grant, um, H2 Ohio, if you've heard about that. That's a big one um, that DeWine is promoting. Um, we have a slate of emergency erosion assistance grants all along the coastline right now, which is helping keep municipalities from losing land to the lake uh, in important areas. And we host grant workshops and team meetings to help kind of funnel people through those, those processes. Um, outreach and education, like Josh mentioned, we post things that our partners do on our website and vice versa. So we have fact sheets, our website, Facebook. Um, we have publications like our access guidebooks if you want to get out on the lake or the rivers. Um, if you're interested in having any of those, they are really beautiful books. We can get some to you. Um, I did not have enough in the office to bring today. But um, I'll share my email in a little bit. And then technical assistance, our engineers will come out on site visits. Um, they have our coastal design manual and um, our online map viewers where you can see maybe problem areas um, and get some insight on how to, to shore up those spaces. OK, so quickly, because you're going to want to hear from the contractor versus me today, um, our coastal nonpoint pollution control program, which is the reason we're all here today. Um, this is an example of nonpoint pollution. So uh, you can't necessarily come, this is Lake Erie obviously, and um, it's kind of that chocolate milk color over here like Josh was saying earlier, a um, little, little more clear towards the east, but um, you can't come and put a finger on where that sediment pollution is coming from, right? Um, there's no end of pipe, there's no discrete source. So it's just sediment will run off the landscape, it'll run through agricultural ditches, it'll run off roadways, um, it'll run off people's yards, all sorts of places, and into the lake. So from the streams to the rivers to the lake. And then we get this, and then we get the sediment um, that's attached to the nutrients, and then we get the algal blooms and a host of other issues. So part of the, the reason we're here today is to help alleviate that a little bit. Um, Nonpoint pollution is not any one person's problem or issue. Uh, there are all sorts of sources for nonpoint pollution, whether it's agriculture, marinas, hydro modification, urban development, you name it. So there's not one single culprit. Um, it's kind of something we all have to work together on. Um, and so we have, so the purpose of our program, it's a federally backed program, and each coastal state has one, um, is to develop and implement management measures for nonpoint source pollution in the Lake Erie Basin. So we've got 35 counties that are a part of our Lake Erie Basin across the state, and we can work with all of these counties. So you'll note, they're not specifically along the coastline. This is a program where we can go down into the Lake Erie Basin and work with people further south um, on ways to manage their nonpoint pollution. And management measures, it's just a term for all sorts of operation and maintenance practices, inspection procedures, uh, certifications, um, and monitoring work that's geared towards reducing and understanding nonpoint pollution. So based on the land use type you're looking at, whether it's agriculture or marinas, you're gonna have different management um, measures that are put in place. And then kind of to, to cap this all off, we have a big program document with all of our land use types. There are six of them, um, and then Amongst those six land use types are over 60 management measures. That was drafted in 2000, and it was conditionally approved for 20 some odd years, nearly, nearly 22 years, and it was approved, actually it was 22 years this January. So it took a while, um, but we finally got full approval, which means more money to support programs like these. Um, and then we have this nice comprehensive document at this point. Um, in that document, there is a section on the urban development land use section that is specific to roads, highways, and bridges. And specific to that is runoff management system. So in other words, roadside ditches. And that's why I'm here today and I'm really excited to see you all here today um, because we're gonna learn about ways to maintain roadside ditches 
so that they aren't contributing to the sedimentation load that we're seeing in the Sugar and River watershed and then into Lake Erie. Um, and these management measures that we're going to hear about today are applicable to all roadside ditches, but this program plan is specifically applicable to um, areas uh, in Ohio with, that don't have NIPTES discharge permits. Okay, so there are, there are a lot of those areas. Um, and finally, uh, this is a list of guiding principles in our program document, and number 10 is also supporting why we're here today. Education and training is integral to the success of non-point source programs. So we're all here to learn and contribute. Again, it's not just one person's problem or one industry's problem. If you're interested, like I said, I do a lot of the grant management at Coastal, and there are all sorts of grant opportunities throughout the year that we can work with municipalities on, whether it's townships, um, villages, cities, nonprofits, you name it. I'll just run through them really quickly. You may have heard about some of them, and maybe we can post these as a resource if you want to read more or click on a link or something like that. I'm not going to read every word. Um, but our Coastal Management Assistance Grants, those are federal dollars that come through our office to folks like you. And if you're interested in things like water quality, coastal planning, um, habitat restoration, this, and you're in the coastal zone, which is kind of a thin sliver right along the coast, this might be something you're interested in. And we um, start the proposal process every fall. It's annual opportunity. And I'd be happy to talk with you about these. A woman named Tina in our office um, works very hard on these. So we, and we get some really cool projects out of these. Um, the non-point source section 319 grants, are, is, that's another annual opportunity through Ohio EPA. And that is also, as the name implies, focused on non-point source pollution reduction. Um, you have to be in a watershed that has an approved um, 319 plan. If you're not sure if your watershed has one, we can work with you and talk to you about that. And then we can point you in the direction of um, who to talk to at OEPA. But that's another opportunity for dollars to help you um, uh, with some projects like these. Runoff reduction, ag, ag and urban, um, stream and floodplain and riparian restoration, you name it. Um, the Lake Erie Commission also puts together a semi-annual opportunity. Some years yes, some years no, they are holding it this year. And if you see these license plates driving around with the lighthouse on it, <coughs> the extra dollars that go toward purchasing that, light, that um, license plate fund this opportunity. So again, it is focused largely on non-point non pollution redu reduction. So if you've got some project ideas, you can talk to us. We can kind of guide you towards the Lake Erie Commission folks. Um, and they can talk to you about your ideas. Uh, at a little higher level, a federal level, um, Sustain Our Great Lakes program. Another one that's um, trying to help people with their non-point source problems. Um, <clears throat> so specifically here, expanding green stormwater infrastructure in the Great Lakes communities. They'll consider projects that it's not necessarily like one ditch or a segment of a ditch, but maybe a regional approach to your ditches. So larger projects. Um, they'd really like to talk with you about. And finally, and then I'm done, um, the Great Lakes Sediment Nutrient Reduction <coughs> grants, a similar thing to the, the previous slide. Um, and it's, it's very interesting, this program is very focused on reducing nutrients um, that are stuck to the sediment, like Josh said, it's sticky. Um, so if we can reduce sedimentation, we can reduce the um, <coughs> nutrient flux into our waterways as well. So again, those are larger kind of maybe, uh, not ditch by ditch, but maybe a watershed approach idea here. So if that's on your slate, these might be some folks you'd like to talk to. Moodry, absolute grass. Um, this has been about 31 years for us to be in the industry. Uh, just a little bit about on my end. Um, we are licensed and certified with stormwater inspection and maintenance. The uh, Brian Putney from Summit Soil and Water has a nice program. If you guys go and check that out, they have certification and same of a lot of this, and then some for retention basins as well. Um, okay, so a little bit about the photos that you're going to see. These were all projects that we had during the 21 season. This being our first, um, this was the last week of June of 2021. I'm showing you a couple things of um, why these pictures, not just necessarily roadside ditch,
but for the process that of hydro seeding and the results given from this system. Um, a little reminder of the 2021 season. We had one of our worst seasons for disease drought that we had. Um, and then we also have had in these past maybe five or 10, 10 years, I'm sure you guys are seeing it, where we are having monsoon rains. We're not having a half inch rain. So we're dealing with a lot different on the environmental end. So um, back to this, uh, what we see here, we're gonna see ditch lines that are all leading to this. The center here where that catch basin is, this is actually a bio cell. There's one at each end that you will see in the photos. So that's just a four foot deep slump for this one. A little holding cell. This one obviously is gonna get grassed over as you see. Um, please don't critique me. I built them, I did not design them. They are not quite the way they should be. <laughs> but anyhow, again, this process that we're using on the hydro seed, um, what we went in here, this is at Lakewood stormwater, or I'm sorry, Lakewood um, sewer plant water treatment. The, this year we finally got all of these guys to agree to put in a low grow grass. So we're dealing with a lot of the fescues, slope mixes and whatnot. But the bottom is low maintenance, low grow, so that we're not dealing with that maintenance end in the cutting and whatnot from it. Um, the big thing also is uh, the products used. So not only is your seed choice, I feel extremely important for what you guys are doing. I know I've talked with some of you already about what you have been doing or maybe aren't quite doing. Um, you were having some issues with, uh, again, seed choices for the areas that you're working. So again, here we have a low growth fescue mix. Uh, we went in with a all wood mulch. You will see through here and as we maybe get outside or whatnot, we'll, we typically use an all wood mulch. We do use a lot of the blends uh, which are a 70-30 blend. You will also see an 80-20 blend on the market or all cellulose. I don't use those so much. Um, if you, I don't know what kind of machines that you guys are having, but if you have mechanical agitation, just go to the wood, you're, or at least the blend, you're gonna have a better result initially um, just from changing that product. The big thing, if you don't mind to click a pick, would you? Thank you. Um, and you can snap a couple of these, same site, this is the end. I think the next one, Josh, uh, or we'll see this ditch line. So this area right down the center here, that's a whole swale that we have cut um, running towards at the back of the uh, track hoe there, that's the opposite bio swale. So Josh, if you wouldn't mind, if keep clicking, you'll see that. And you can pop through them, Josh, until you see the whole area. So now we have, there, uh, there you go. So now the whole area is hydro seeded. Um, and, I, and I apologize guys, as you see, I'm jumping all around, but this happens. Um, first and foremost, very important, uh, I see, and I thank you guys for using some straw mats locally in these past couple of uh, townships that we've driven through. It, something is better than nothing. Seed and soil contact, first and foremost. So we hydro seed first, if you're hand seeding, whatever, let's get the seed to the soil. So we do an application. Josh, if you click that. Now you can see the following morning, we, we actually had a rainstorm, it poured rain for about an hour that day, so we bailed out. The next morning we came in, laid our mats down, staples, 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 we cannot put enough in. Um, one note here for a little critiquing, yes, that swale, you know, again, running our mats. We love to, we, we try not to, being that that's a swale, I go against the grade, we like to run them perpendicular to the slopes so that we have less open edge compared to if we were running a full, if we were running a steep slope uh, parallel with it, it, then we just have a large open edge of everything and you're talking about putting thousands of staples in to really get your right um, application or result, sorry. Josh, if you click one more. So my, our final application of these systems is to then hydro seed again over the straw mats. Um, the swales, ditches, we are creating them to take water. So the movement is just kicking our ass and taking all the turbidity, taking all of our products with them. So we want to slow the water down, but I also like the fact of getting another spray and getting more glue on to a sensitive area. 
Okay, so Josh, give us a click. I think how I have the picture set up, we, I went through all of the hydro seed, then I went back to show you the end result by the end of the year. Um, this is at the Euclid wastewater treatment plant. Um, another important note to remember is that the water treatment plants, and um, I will say the construction company that works at these plants, loves aggregate. Um, we have feet of aggregate under that one inch of topsoil. Very hard to grow grass. That's key what I'm getting at here because of other items that we're going. Um, now, we're getting into the slope mix again. So let's talk, I talked about the mulch briefly. Let's talk about the tackifiers. Who, who, who has hydroceded or is using a unit or you guys have, have anybody done the process? No? Okay. Um, with that said, are any of you guys, have any of the municipalities thinking about it? I know that what you, uh, Munson, Chardon, Jaga, they get into it a little bit. I only ask because I'd like to know what you guys are doing so that we can improve. And if you're not doing anything, well, I guess then we're going to just go to the improve. Um, so on the note again of the glue, I think that I spoke with, was it Kurt maybe, um, that said that we, you guys hadn't really used the glues or tackifiers and were kind of just using a mulch and throwing seed in. Um, I don't know who seeded the ditches right out here. Do, do we know that, Kurt? Is that something you guys did? County. County did that. Um, and if we, if we look at it, if you guys, before you leave, if you have a chance just to drive up Auburn a little bit, I don't know where else it might be, but I know it's fresh batch out there. And you'll see that it is adhering to the center of your ditch slope and again, just different times, different products, or lack of a product, so you get a lot of clumping in the hydroceder. Um, I think the important thing is a tackifier. I will introduce you to the tackifier that we use. Um, the name of it is EarthGuard. It is a polymer-based product. Um, what is that doing for us? The EarthGuard is actually a... Um, negatively charged, we're, we're actually creating, it's a scientific uh, interaction where we're bonding with the soil between a negative and a positive charge. So we're not just gluing something to the soil, again, we, we're, we're getting into the science of it and we have a better result from that. Whatever glues that, and tackifiers that you guys can use, please add something in. Um, you're more than welcome, Josh can get you my information and, and whatnot, but Site one in Chesterland, those guys are pretty good. Jeremy, um, JMD, which is now Haynes, in regards to education on products, those guys will definitely direct you in a good manner. If you're interested in doing so, I would be glad to help out. Um, Josh, let's go on. Again, we see, uh, you'll see through all of my pictures, whether it's a ditch line or a slope, we look at all of the sensitive areas that we see that are moving water, so we'll address those, and that's what we had here. We do actually have a little swale that they created under this, just because they had so much erosion. They raised the grade three inches, it's rolling over the curb. So we're, we tried to deal with that as best we could. Josh, if you click again, I think, well, we went to the airport. As you'll see, I, I'm bouncing back again just from the growth pictures, but the one, Josh, could you bump back, I'm sorry. So right actually behind our truck here, we have, there's another waterway that's coming out and we did the same thing. We've seeded, we've matted, we've seeded again only in those um, important areas. Josh, go ahead, thank you. Um, this is now down at Hopkins Airport. They had, we had to install the, uh, redo the drainage soil. They hooked up new sewer systems for the airport. Um, and go ahead and click through, Josh. We'll get to our ditch line here. This is on the end of the runway, and I have the uh, wherever where am I at? South, south. I guess that's a south end. But we had a 1,300 foot ditch line all the way as far as you can see, and it dog legs to the left where the catch basin was. They had already uh, filled the ditch line to the gr to grade. So here we are again, just seeding over our uh, gravel and what minimal soil we had. So we sprayed first, Josh, I think then we'll get to a, we, we matted the ditch line and then we sprayed it again. Another advantage, guys, of the mats is that not, we're, we're slowing water. So there's two, there's several, many different types. It's all depending on your budget. 
I'm sticking towards the um, S75 or S150s, which are single or double netted mats. Um, most economical, and it, wherever we go over that, yes, you're getting a better map, but we're really getting into a, to a probably a budgeting issue for municipalities. But either way, um, other mats might be considered like TRMs, which are a turf reinforcement mat. You get into just long-term mats and different, different materials. But the advantage of them is, being that they're woven, A, we're keeping the, you're keeping that straw, right, instead of having it blow all over. But I am hydroceding over it, so that in itself, the glue is tacking it down to and holding it. But as the water moves over it, all of the netting, we're slowing down the speed of the water, reducing turbidities, but at the same time, we're going to have all of them. They, they create them. It's basically a little woven mesh, but all of those slowly trap sediments as they go to. So a couple things there, yes, we're keeping it out of all the waterways, but we're also collecting that sediment and then giving an area for something to, vegetation to grow as well. So that's more towards the ditch line point where we'll collect, we'll utilize mats, but we'll also get into, um, which I also have, the filter socks. I don't know if any guy, uh, you guys have used those. I see some of the guys in Chesterland just did the silt fence to slow the water down and make little checks instead of using the rock checks to do. Um, we 99% use the filter sock for the simple fact that it is install and forget about it. We don't have to go back. We can hydroseed over it or just let Mother Nature collect some sediment and the vegetation grow on it that way. But those are really nice on that, for that note, for multiple reasons. Again, we can vegetate them, but you guys don't have to worry about getting back out in the field and going pulling tripping stakes and making that kind of mess. And then when you did that, you tear up that area, and here we go again. Now we have another barrier in the ditch. So I think it's a win-win um, on the ditch line on, on both ends. Uh, go ahead, Josh. And if I'm rambling, guys, or if I need to, we want to move on, just point, holler, tell me to get out. Um, okay. So, the view, it, being that we're so exploded with the view, uh, the, this is back at Euclid. Euclid was seeded the la I'm sorry, the first week of October 2021. Real quick, back to the airport. The airport was the third week in September that we did that seeding. If we were actually looking at the video here, we have in, in um, it was 10, this is a 10 to 14 day picture. We already had our germination. Um, again, remembering that we had 80 degree temperature till Halloween essentially. So we were in a drought, not only drought, a big thing that is hugely important. I know it's a tiny bit off track, but to, to grow grass in this condition, we need other elements added. And why do I say that? A little simple thing that was very hard this year, you probably saw areas that grew grass. You might have seen a have fuzz over, let's say just this table, whole area had fuzz over it at 8 a.m. in the morning, and whether it was noon that same day or 8 a.m. the following morning, you notice the grass start to wilt and brown out. It's an airborne disease. We can only combat it by adding something to the tank or to the soil. It isn't anything we can do otherwise. When the temperature, humidity, add those two numbers together, if we were at 130 or better, it is an airborne pathogen. So we fought that a huge amount. Why am I bringing it up? Because we made it through it utilizing all these products that we're talking about. And basically what we are doing with the seed, with our products, is coating that seed to give it the protection that it needs. And at the same time, the coatings have fertilizers, biostimulants, all these great little additives other than just a little bit of seed and fertilizer. But to make it through the harsh environment, again, we're spending all this money to go and do it, and you guys don't want to go and do it twice. Maybe some of you do, but that's not our point. We want to make it right the first time and, yeah, protect the lakes and rivers, but just get that vegetation to grow. Um, go ahead, Josh. So with that said, this is our two-week to 21-day and we start coming in to 30% and 40% germination. Um, again, time of year, that is very impressive. Secondly, the fescues are typically 21 to 28 day growers. So I don't think I need to do that math. That it's, everything is happening a lot sooner 
with taking the few extra steps and putting a little bit of time into the hydrocene mix. Go ahead, Josh. Thank you. And same thing, we just have a couple clicks through here. We'll see what these are just, again, the, the uh, third week batch of picks. And I think we're going to jump around. Here we go. Now we're back to the uh, Lakewood site. And again, this was done essentially 4th of July. It's never, it did not get watered outside of the, which I, was, I told them not to do. We don't want to water um, at that time. We went watering. I, I don't want to go down this track. It's not our, our, our topic here. But with that, the result that we had with the site that was left alone, which is the same thing as a roadside ditch. You guys aren't going to go back and care for it. We don't want to do that. We want to fire and forget. So to have the essentially a 70 plus percentage of coverage with A, the seed types, remembering that these seed types, that's what it should look like in a year's time, a full season of growth, just by the nature of the seed, they're slow growing seeds. We're speeding that process up. But we also have an even coverage. We don't have that spotty coverage with everything. So that's another huge point in getting our soil, bare soil, bare ground. We want to give vegetation on it. So again, here's just the end result from the season. Go ahead, Josh. But you can see as we go around, you'll see the, why are some areas thicker than others. It just again, that, that was it'll get shade at certain times. It would hold a little bit of moisture to it. It's, like, that's, it's just all the climate and the lay of the land. Go ahead, Josh, a few pictures from this site. These, this particular site was uh, several acres. And let, uh, a quick note, since I did bring up the disease before, there's a swale going from, the tra from transformer to transformer, the little catch basin right down here. But if you notice in the center there, you'll see an area, that area is lightly browned out. That area did get the disease, it's called Pythium. But again, with the result that we have, or the system that we used, as well as type of seed, we still had this phenomenal amount of uh, uh, germination. I tell you guys, uh, ryegrass is not it, okay? I, if there's a little in the tank, that's all right. It, it's not what you want to be putting on. Um, I'm getting some looks, why? Because you want grass and what do you think is five or seven days. Knock yourself out. You're, that's not what you want to do for the simple fact of what is going to happen in the nature of that grass. Turf grasses we don't want to put on the slopes because they're going to grow, they, they will continually grow and choke each other out where our hard fescues and fine fescues that are designed for that, they are only going to grow into your 6, 12 inch range typically, a few of them might get 18, but they are grown, their, their nature is okay to lay over and not choke each other out, to be cut maybe once to three times a year. That's the, the whole nature of that beast. So we're always getting good performance from it. You guys are staying out of the ditch lines with the mowers. No disrespect, it's not your fault, but you have no choice but to scalp them when you're doing that stuff, you know, and then you, it, it is what it is. So I think that uh, that's why we find we're so happy to get them to change and approve a new seed. Now all the guys at these plants, I will say they're happier. They're not sitting on a mower mowing grass every week because of the fact that it's just growing because we put the wrong seed in. So it, that makes a big difference in both two parts, your, your end result, but also a performance end. Um, back to my seed point, I'm sorry, uh, with the, the pythium and disease. The ryegrasses, being that they germinate so fast, are extremely susceptible to that disease. So why do we have some death? Because the ryegrass died. I said, happy, let the ryegrass die. I don't care. I know what was going to happen a month after, two months down the line, as Mother Nature did, and she took care of her, um, and we have vegetation. Again, it's a little bit of a system. I think that what have I learned in the 28 of my 30 years of hydroseeding? Um, we have many products, like I said before. Something is better than nothing. Um, but choose the right products for each particular job. Don't just throw one, one method or one type of seed at it. Look at what we need and what will be best for you guys. Josh, if you would, thank you. And I think they're the same thing. You see the ditch line. You, it, again, it's just the performance that we have, the end result that we have from the conditions. Again, to shooting at one time, taking that time to, to mix it properly and use the products. 
And then here we are back at um, Euclid. This now is in our one month of photos. We are just getting to... So this is just before Halloween, if my brain is working properly this morning. Um, again, just the results, but it's also important to know that through all of these photos and all of these projects, like I said, we not only had drop, but when we had rain, we were getting inches an hour. So we're, when, we, when we look at all of the areas, we're not seeing any of the frills and any of the washout. Again, it was just going in with right application and right product has a, the most to do with it. It isn't just me going left to right with the hose or, or tower. Um, Real quick question on it, Matt. So the difference between, I guess, which one would you rather use? The, the one that's the uh, photo, I guess, the, the stuff that breaks down, or like the, the stuff that has the jute matting, the jute through it? Um, sure. Um, I again, anything is good. Each project may deter, uh, you know, direct you for one to the other. I think that if you need a long term, and again, my hydro seeding process was make, giving this its longevity. So if you weren't going to do a double hydro seed, maybe it didn't fit in the budget or whatnot, I would say go to a jute TRM type of mat. The big difference is, again, economics of it, where these mats might be, you know, 40 or 70 bucks for a roll, where then you go from 70 to hundreds of dollars a roll. I mean, a, a, a TRM is a several hundred bucks for a 50 foot roll. So again, um, Yes, each project has its own, but I know that we all are working with budgets too. So that's where, it, unfortunately, yes, there's something to go, but you have to, you got to ask for what's right for you and what's going to work for your budget. If you, if the budget's like, hey, we want to just do it right, that's where I would go into. Let's put a TRN. Let's use a little longer term mat if, if that allows. Um, I, I hope that kind of answered your question. Again, not one being. None of them are wrong. The areas that all overspray, at least in my my method, as we saw, I'm trying to do a 180. So I'm walking with it, spraying both sides, especially when we have the slopes and the irregularity. So we do try and get 100% fair dirt coverage. But I'll always typically spray a little up on that high side, a little thick. Each area is a little different to where I feel that it's taking the water. So I'll barrel it up there and pile it a little thicker. But you'll notice how this one too, we're fighting obviously morning rain. So we have a water content already. So if for some reason this was an area, obviously our ditch, the actual ditch itself, but the slope is gonna take water, we could do another application. I would actually let this sit, let it absorb, and then we'll blow another coat over it. No seed or anything, just our tackifier and mulch. Um, again, those are areas of main concern. We see, even up there, you saw a few areas where it was furrowing. We'll kick in those a little heavier like that because we know it's an area taken up. Um, but you see the difference in the mix. Um, just the snottiness of it. Even if you if you just dip your hands in that water, you'll see the it's slippery because of the glue and how it acted, and how it's acting, but you see it as it's globbing. I would call it that snottiness to it, but that's the glue, that's what it should look like. It should look like our ugly sneeze, and then we know we got a good mix, but it's a good visual in what your mix should look like. So as, as the tank's going, you'll notice as, we, as you're just splashing water and what the drops of water do, and then as we are making our mix and the different products go through, you'll start to see the pools. So the tackifier is starting to activate right away and hydrate itself. So we go from water droplets to drips and then to lines. And again, that snottiness that creates. But you can actually watch it go on in the tank. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes. But in that process, it, you can actually watch that transformation. Uh, how do you dial in the right pressure? How do you know? <laughs> it, it, does it depend on the soil or the slope? Exactly. Um, you got a part-time job, you know. <laughs> um, that's correct. Every, as I as I try and say, every project and every part of the project really has its own entity. Yes, we may use the same seed type, but you kind of saw from here, from where our steep this was, or how close I am, different parts of the mix. 
now that we shortened the hose, that pressure went up, I might have had to change. It could be all of those elements, whether it just be the actual soils, the surface we're shooting, or the conditions in the environment, or the unit itself. Because the mix, we, we have a time, we have measurements, and we try, but again, it, it's, a, it's a finicky item. So you could get a little difference. This is really close to being we, what we would call a perfect mix, just in regards to how it's spraying. So you try and find a happy medium between mulch, really the tackifier, the water, and your mulch, because it, as it's having that activation, will go too far. And so if I put, say, another ounce of glue in where I'm at now, one to three ounces more, and I would have probably lost 25 PSI because it'll create some air pocket. It'll look to get a little harder to push. So there is that happy medium. It's a trial and error. I've been on the other side of the fence for days. Even when we were testing the new product back in 11, the roadside ditch, the two brand new products never had them in the tank. I was fiddling with it for an hour just before you guys could even see me spray, but we learned not to use that product. <laughs> but again, those are, they're, they're very finicky, so you need to know what's going on. There's a lot of guys that are, uh, are people that are selling glues and tackifiers, but each one has its has its own little uh, entity to it and how it works. Some of them go quick, some go fast, so it could be a nightmare. We've had to dig stuff out of the tank where it just made a big block of jello, so we had to keep adding water to it. This concludes the overview to the roadside ditch maintenance training that was held in Munson Township. Thank you to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the ODNR Office of Coastal Management for providing funding for this project, and thank you to our other project partners. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact CRWP or visit our website.